Please welcome Michael. Thank you very much. So good morning everyone, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks very much to all at QUT for the very kind invitation. So let's see if this works. Can I click forward? Okay, so um, actually before I start to speak about the future of employment, I always think it's useful to look back at the history of employment. So we have this concern today that technology is supplanting jobs, but actually that concern is absolutely nothing new. So if we go back all the way to 1589, a gentleman by the name of William Lee invented the stocking frame knitting machine. And he was quite proud of his invention. It was able to do things that had never been able to be performed before by machine. And so in pursuance of his interests, he had approached the monarch of the time, Queen Elizabeth I, for patent protection. So to his shock, the queen actually turned him down. And the reasons for her um, refusal were actually derived from this fear of technological unemployment. The fact that, as the queen says, uh, it would assuredly bring her subjects to ruin by depriving them of employment, making them beggars. So it's debatable, debatable to what extent the Queen was actually motivated by any kind of altruistic concern for her subjects. A much more likely historical explanation is that it was the political power of the guilds in England at the time who were kind of exerting influence on the Queen, forcing her to uh, reject this innovation. And in fact, that political pressure was so strong historically that William was forced out of England altogether. So despite the fact that these concerns about technology putting workers out of jobs have been with us for a long time, in fact, we haven't seen a lot of those fears actually come to reality. So one figure that illustrates exactly that point is that at the beginning of the 20th century, about 40% of all US employment was engaged in agriculture. At the end of the 20th century, the figure was less than 2%. And yet despite that completely transformational change in the nature of work due to employment, due to technology, sorry, we didn't see an associated change in unemployment. So the unemployment rate at the beginning of the 20th century was about 5%, and it was still about 5% at the end of the 20th century. So the real question we set out to answer in our work is, to what extent might things be different now? So are these new technologies that we're seeing likely to challenge this, this historical pattern of, in fact, employment resisting technological change? So the second question we set out to identify um, is if anyone is put out of work, who is it likely to be? So back in William Lee's time, the people who were most threatened were those guildsmen who were actually quite high skilled. So they were responsible for taking a product all the way through a long sequence of operations from raw material to finished product. In the end, their jobs were replaced by a more factory-like approach where a um, parallel sequence of relatively unskilled workers were able to perform the same tasks. So back in William Lee's time, it was technology that um, was making relatively high skilled workers unemployed. But the narrative more familiar to us from the 20th century has been much more that of low skilled workers being put out of work. People like the telephone switchboard operators that I've got at the right hand side of the screen there. But as put by Darren Asimoglu, that's very much a 20th century phenomenon. And we we're interested to what extent uh, that 20th century trend might continue into the 21st. So as I say, we're interested in answering this question of what's different now? And to me, the root of the answer to that question is advances in my own field of machine learning, which I would define as the study of algorithms that can learn and act, even in the face of uncertainty. So the interesting thing about these algorithms then is that they're actually replacing some of the most quintessentially human activities, the things that we'd hold you know, most uh, identifiable with humanity itself. So why is that even a good thing to do? Why should we even be interested in replacing humans with algorithms? And to provide one answer to that question, I'd like to point to the, one of my favorite studies of all time, Danziger et al, 2011. So the y-axis you can see in this plot is the fraction of time that judges award parole to parole seekers as a function of the ordinal position in the day. So the judges start out extraordinarily positive in the morning, only for that generosity to decline leading into their morning coffee break. They're perked up by that morning coffee, only for that to subside away again leading into lunch. And post-lunch is basically a complete write-off, as you can see. <laughs> 
So I'm aware that we're probably somewhere about here in the day. So hopefully you're positively inclined to appraising this talk, fingers crossed. But nonetheless, I think it is an excellent illustration of why we might want to prefer algorithms that could be vigilant wherever they are in the day. They're not distracted by hunger. Um, they can perhaps you know, operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All these things are a strong motivation for replacing unreliable, heuristic-ridden human judgment with principled algorithmic judgment. So that's one reason we might want to prefer an algorithm to a human worker. Here's another, which is that, as I'm sure everybody is aware, algorithms are increasingly a cheaper alternative to human work. So this plot is probably one that you've seen many times before in various guises. It depicts the cost of a single unit of computing as a function of time, where we start at 1940 on the far left-hand side and continue all the way out to 2010 on the right-hand side. And as you can see, there is this very strong negative trend in the cost of computing that's been sustained over that entire 70-year period, with the uh, obvious exception of the iPad 2, which you can see is a bit of an outlier there on the far right-hand side of the, the plot. So um, associated with that development in computing becoming increasingly cheap, we've also seen the rise of big data, a phrase that's probably familiar to everyone in the room. It was highlighted as the most hyped word of 2014, I think. But nonetheless, despite the hype, I really think that big data is something new and fundamentally transformational in our society. So again, some numbers to the phenomenon. We've got an, inf an estimate of the information contained in all the printed material available in the world today of about 200 petabytes. Another estimate was made of the information contained in all the words ever spoken by human beings, and that estimate was about five exabytes. But in fact, both of those estimates are completely dwarfed by the predicted, ed predicted internet traffic this year, which is expected to approach one zettabyte. So we really are seeing information at a scale completely unlike anything we've seen in the past. And to me, at least, it would actually be surprising if we didn't see some kind of fundamental changes in what we're able to do with algorithms as a consequence. So to be a bit more concrete about what big data is enabling, I like to speak to the example of Google Translate. So machine translation, the use of an algorithm to translate text from one language to another, was for a very long time seen as something that was more or less technologically impossible. It was thought that the kind of subtle intuitions that human translators brought to their job were not going to be readily reproducible in code. So it came as a bit of a shock when Google was able to introduce this fantastic service, Google Translate, which, while not able to do everything that a human translator can do, has increasingly become good enough that it can actually you know, serve a really useful purpose in our lives. So what has driven the success of Google Translate and similar services is not really the invention of more sophisticated algorithms, although there's a little bit of that. What's really driven it is the increasing availability of big data. So in particular, Google is drawing upon enormous corpses of pre-translated text. So as one example, they use 200 billion words drawn from official UN documents, whereby the charter of the UN, those documents are required to be translated into six different languages. So if Google is provided with a short phrase, three or four words that it can identify in one of those documents, it has ready-made access to five different translations of that particular phrase. So you can see as that corpus of text available to the algorithm grows with the increasing amount of data available through the internet, Google is able to make successively more sophisticated translations. So, <clears throat> Another example where big data is having an increasing influence, and in fact one that's perhaps even more pertinent to employment, is that in retail. So you're probably familiar with examples like the self-checkouts in uh, supermarkets. You might, be even, might have even heard of um, Applebee's in the US replacing waiters by tablets on tables in restaurants. But in fact, the more transformational change from my perspective is that enabled by the uh, access to big data sets characterizing the spending patterns of consumers. So in particular, Amazon, um, you'll know if you've ever used Amazon service, is able to make actually quite sophisticated recommendations to you on the basis of the spending patterns that's observed of customers that are somewhat like you. So as these data sets grow and grow, 
Amazon is able to make recommendations that in many cases probably even exceed the capacity of a human salesperson in a store. That is, Amazon has access to an entire product catalog. It's got access to millions upon millions of customers and can identify subtle trends and communities within those customers that enable it to make these ever more sophisticated recommendations. So as a consequence, I think we can be relatively confident in making the prediction that these developments will lead to fundamental changes in the nature of work. So a final example where big data has had enormous influence is another one that for a long time was seen as more or less beyond the scope of automation, and it's that of autonomous driving. So as recently as 2004, the kind of conventional wisdom was that autonomous vehicle was completely impossible. So prominent economist Levi Menain, who are far from you know, unintelligent people, stated in their book that it was hard to rep imagine discovering the set of rules that could replicate a driver's behavior, in particular in executing a left turn in the US against on uh, oncoming traffic. So what they were thinking about there is the enormous number of kind of subtle cues that humans draw upon in making that decision about when to execute the turn. And to some extent, I think we can be, you know, um, we, we can understand the difficulties there. We can understand where they were coming from. But nonetheless, in 2012, of course, Nevada did indeed issue a driving license to Google's self-driving car. So what has enabled that transition? What has enabled self-driving cars to take to the roads? Well, actually, again, it's been the rise of big data and increasingly sophisticated algorithms within machine learning. So the success of Google's cars in particular is very much due to Google's amassing increasingly precise maps of road networks. So with the decreasing cost of computer storage, Google is able to store on its vehicles inch precision maps of the entire road networks that their vehicles are likely to find themselves in. And then with the, an appropriate algorithm, they can simply access that data in order to execute a plan as to where they should go uh, in order to get to a particular target destination. So the point I was trying to make here is that, in fact, the mass market vehicles of today, even this Nissan Leaf, which you can see here, um, which has been outfitted by uh, Oxford's own mobile robotics group, more or less have all the hardware on board that they need in order to be autonomous. So they've already got the safety systems, they've already got sensors. In fact, all they need really is the right data set and the right algorithm in order to become autonomous. And in fact, in doing so, you can imagine these vehicles becoming far safer, far more effective drivers than any, any human would ever able to be. So in particular, the autonomous drivers of this car are not going to be distracted by singing along to Taylor Swift on the radio. They're going to be able to see both in front and behind them simultaneously. They might have access to kind of native GPS and LiDAR sensing. And in the long term, they might be able to be networked to all the other vehicles on the road. So as a consequence, we're going to see really fundamental changes in the nature of transportation. So I'm thinking here about stats like, for example, um, fatalities on the road being amongst the top 10 causes of death worldwide, and at about 90% of those being caused by human error. So you can imagine the enormous benefits that might be achievable through the wide-scale adoption of these technologies. there are other consequences as well. So not only are these vehicles going to be the beneficiaries of big data and enabling them to perform tasks that were previously thought non-automatable, they're also, with all those sensors on board, going to be recording their environment in a way that's never been possible in the past. So here I'd like to speak to the example of the Chelyabinsk meteorite back in 2013. So you might have seen amazing footage of that meteorite striking the Earth. And the reason we have that footage is that Russian drivers are a little bit paranoid. And what they do is very often place cameras or video cameras on the dashboards of their car. So if they get into an accident, they've got some record of what's happened. So they can take that to the appropriate insurers. So as a consequence of that recording, at the time the meteorite struck, a number of drivers out on the road had recorded this you know, amazing footage that enabled all kinds of um, new science as a consequence. But that's only going to continue as vehicles get increasingly instrumented and are recording their environments at all times. So obviously that will have consequences for media detection, but you can also think about the consequences for law enforcement. So if this vehicle observes a crime around it, it's going to be able to record that data and report it to the appropriate officials. 
And it's also going to have enormous consequences for insurance in recording the patterns of a driver's behavior. These vehicles are going to be able to um, you know, allocate insurance premiums in a much more efficient way. So the consequences of these kinds of uh, self-driving vehicles to me are going to be absolutely um, fundamental for employment. So there are some examples of this we can already see. So in the upper right here we've got the QC bot, which is automating the task of delivering meals and medicines around hospitals. In the very near future, I think we're likely to see the automation of mining vehicles, and it's fairly clear to see why that's an important concern. I think about 30% of all the costs of miners today go to staffing, particularly in remote mine sites. The technology exists today to automate as much as 10% of all mining vehicles. This is not a far future thing. Tomorrow there is the economic incentive to automate one-tenth of all these vehicles. And the first fully autonomous mine site, according to our best estimates today, is probably only about 10 years away. So absolutely something that's very uh, imminent and fundamental, in particular to the economy of this state. So we're also going to see um, consequences for retail. This is in the far left of the slide, the Oshbot, which is been deployed by a hardware store in California to guide customers to the appropriate part of the store according to their spoken commands and spoken requests for products. So this is exciting to me because it combines these autonomous vehicle technologies with the kind of recommender systems that I spoke to before used by, for example, Amazon. So then the obvious next question is, well, if robots and algorithms can serve customers, if they can drive vehicles and generally dig through data and process data even better than I, what am I actually still any good for? <laughs> so in answer to that question, our study set out to identify what we called bottlenecks to automation. So the kinds of characteristics of jobs that we thought rendered them fairly secure from automation at least over the next 20 years. And the first two of those bottlenecks we identified I think are relatively intuitive. So in particular, they are creativity and social intelligence. And what unites those two bottlenecks is the fact that humans possess a very deep reservoir of tacit knowledge about the society and culture we find ourselves in that's very difficult to reproduce in code. So for example, to be creative, let's say you're trying to write a hit song it's relatively easy actually to design an algorithm that is able to churn out songs ad infinitum. But what's very difficult is to teach that algorithm the difference between a good song and a bad song. Because in doing so, as humans, we draw upon an enormous variety of cultural cues amassed over our lifetime. And it's very difficult for us to somehow get that into code. In a similar way, in order to render an algorithm able to perform social intelligent tasks, we'd have to somehow teach it about all the kind of cultural and social cues that come naturally intuitively to us, but are, again, very difficult to write down explicitly in a way that an algorithm could perform those tasks. So the third bottleneck is perhaps a little bit less intuitive, but again, draws upon um, this requirement to you know, reproduce deep reservoirs of human tacit knowledge. So the bottleneck is that of autonomous manipulation and perception. So to understand why that's a bottleneck, consider what I have to do in order to pick up this glass from the table. So while that came fairly naturally to me, despite my jet lag, you can see what I've actually had to do is distinguish that glass from the table on which it sat, despite the fact the glass is transparent. So I've had to distinguish those two different objects. I've had to have some kind of a priori expectation of the material characteristics of the glass, such that I grip it with sufficient force to lift it off the table but not so much force that it shatters. And I have to be able to do this regardless of the lighting conditions, right? I can do this even if it's raining, um, regardless of uh, you know, many other factors that would necessarily confuse an algorithm trying to perform the same task. So for that reason, while robots are able to do a lot of manipulation today, reproducing the full faculties of human fingers and human eyes is still quite a long way away. The extent to which we are able to perform manipulation is reliant on how well we can structure an environment. So as one example of that, 
my favorite manipulator of recent times is the universal gripper, which I've depicted in the middle of the slide there. It's basically a hacky stack, so a kind of rubber balloon filled with rice hooked up to a vacuum. So to grip an object, all it does is squish that hacky sack over the object it's trying to pick up, suck the air out such that suction is formed between the object and the gripper, and it's then able to lift it up and move it elsewhere. So absolutely ingenious, but you can see that it performs manipulation there by sidestepping a lot of the things that we are actually able to do. And of course, it's not going to be able to do all the manipulation tasks that we are. So for that reason, I think it's important to distinguish what we can and cannot expect in kind of perception and manipulation tasks. So again, for a long time, people have been forecasting that something like Daisy the robotic housemaid was just around the corner. But actually, I think that's very far from the truth. So you can imagine to clean a house, this robotic housemaid is going to be a, required to distinguish a pot plant, for example, which contains dirt from a dirty plate, something that comes naturally to us, not so easy to teach an algorithm about. And it's going to have to be able to do that even if your house, like my house, contains a variety of unlikely objects strewn across the floor. So for all these reasons, we're probably not going to see a robotic house made, but we are going to see automation in places where we can build in structures to the environment. And I think an excellent example of that is Kiva Systems, bought out by Amazon for nearly 800 million US to automate its warehousing. So in particular, what Kiva Systems does is move objects around a warehouse, not by fully understanding the structure of the warehouse, but by reference to little barcodes that you can kind of see um, on the floor here. So in that way, in building that kind of prior information and structure into the task that the robot is required to perform, and in fact, in this case, sidestepping entirely the requirement to pick up and move objects, that is, these shelving units are just transported to a point at which a human picker can access the objects on the shelf, they are able to do a fair amount of the job. Not at all, but enough to still have influence on employment in this particular occupation. So just to recap, we've identified social intelligence, creativity and perception as bottlenecks to computerization. But to try and put some numbers to our intuitions, we performed some analysis on data we drew from the US. So for the US, we have this fantastic data set in which for 702 different occupations, we had a list of dozens and dozens of occupational characteristics. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US goes out and surveys workers in all these different occupations and asks them to what extent their job requires things like persuasion, negotiation, finger dexterity, all characteristics that we thought might be predictive of a job's susceptibility to computerization. We thought they might reflect one or more of those bottlenecks. So then, the next step was to teach the algorithm about which occupations were likely to be automatable and which weren't. So in particular, we provided the algorithm with what we call a training set of 70 occupations, that's 10% of the entire data set, which we saw either being automated already or which we thought in the next 20 years were almost impossible to automate. So here are some of the results for a list of occupations. The column on the left here, if you can see my little laser pointer, represents some of the occupations we provided to the algorithm as examples of occupations that were or weren't automatable. So in particular, we told it that people like data entry keys almost certainly were automatable. Industrial truck opera operators, due to the rise of autonomous vehicles, were almost certainly automatable. But people like clergy, for example, probably weren't. So on that basis, the algorithm analyzed the data, looked at these patterns identifying the characteristics of jobs that were and weren't predicted to be automatable and returned these probabilities in the right-hand column. So you can see here these, in most cases, match what we'd expected. So they tell us that data entry keys have a high probability, umpires and referees, an interesting result, are highly automatable due to the, um, you know, perhaps less biased decision-making that an algorithm is able to make. Um, but it also returned to us some surprises. So for example, we told the algorithm that waiters and waitresses were probably not automatable. We thought that the kind of social intelligence that a waiter or waitress brings to their job, the kind of interaction with customers, was not something we could see readily automatable in the near future. Nonetheless, the algorithm came back to us and said, 
in fact, it expects the probability to be very high, 0.94 for those occupations. And in fact, I think subsequently to the study, we've seen some evidence that the algorithm was right and perhaps we were wrong in that, as I said earlier, restaurants like Applebee's in the US are replacing waiters with tablets. The other surprise here was uh, the example of economists. So my co-author in this study is in fact an economist <laughs> and was very keen to get economists in the data set as an example of something that was non-automatable. Despite that, you can see the algorithm came back with its own opinion that economists had a probability almost 50-50 of being automated over the next 20 years. So I guess time will tell in that particular respect. So then, of course, the headline figure was that about 47% of all employment in the US today, so all jobs, were potentially automatable over the next 20 years. So we're not saying they will be automated, only that the technological capability might exist within 20 years to replace those jobs. And we can see that if you had examine this plot in greater detail, the occupations that are most at risk are exactly those we might expect. So we can see a whole host of occupation in transportation and material moving in brown, at risk exactly due to the influence of those self-driving vehicles. We see occupations in sales in this red streak here that are highly at risk due to the influence of recommender systems operating upon big data. And likewise for office and administrative support, where the ability of an algorithm to process large data sets, again, will probably have quite severe in influence on employment. At the far left-hand side of the plot, we see occupations that are far more secure and they encompass more or less all we might expect. So occupations in management, business and financial occupations where you could make the argument that a large degree of social intelligence is required, a relatively secure. Um, occupations in computer engineering and science where at least as someone working in the field myself, I'd like to argue require a large amount of creativity, are relatively secure. And likewise, for education, legal, community services, arts and media occupations, all those that would require a large amount of social or uh, creative skills are relatively secure. Subsequent to the original study, we went off and reproduced the analysis for the UK. <coughs> and other authors have done similar kind of mappings for other countries in the European Union, in particular the Scandinavian countries. Now the difficulty in performing this analysis, and one thing I want to get right out front, is that the numbers aren't directly comparable due to the different aggregation of occupations in different countries. So for the UK, we only had 366 different occupation classes, about half the number of occupations relative to the US. So what that means in aggregating a high probability of computerization occupation with a low probability of computerization occupation from the US down to perhaps a single occupation in the UK, we kind of end up with this combined occupation that's somewhere near the middle. So as a consequence, we see the overall probability of computerization being a little bit um, less extreme than in the US. That is only about 35% of occupations being at risk in the UK, but nonetheless, still a fairly substantial chunk of employment at risk due to these kinds of technological trends. So in further subsequent work, we set out with Nesta in the UK to try and put further numbers to this expectation that creative jobs were particularly secure from automation. So in particular in the UK, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport identifies occupations as being creative or not. And we use those to try and predict the creativity of all occupations. And then to correlate that against the computerizability that we've assessed in our previous study. So you can see that there's a very stark trend. The um, darkness of these little squares represent uh, employment. So the, this lump out here represents most of the jobs in the UK at um, a high probability of computerization and a low probability of creativity. But if you have any substantial creative content in your job, which would place you at the high probability end of this plot, your job is almost certainly secure from automation. So 87% of the most creative jobs are at low risk of computerizability. Now, the final piece of analysis we've done recently is that in conjunction with city research, where we tried to identify not just occupations that were at risk, were at risk but in fact, entire industries, where of course an industry comprises many different occupations together. <coughs> 
And here, in fact, we saw perhaps even starker differences between industries than we might have expected. So it might be difficult to see this plot. Um, if you'd like the full figures, they're available in a report with Citibank, available on my website in particular. But right at the top of the list there, you can perhaps see that accommodation and food services has as much as 87% of employment at high risk of automation. And as I say, that's due to the rise of um, self-driving vehicles. We see firms in the US developing robotic butlers able to deliver guests to their rooms in a hotel. We're going to see algorithms able to substitute for desk clerks in, in hotels. Um, at a similarly high risk of automation, we see transportation and warehousing, again due to the rise of autonomous vehicles. And way down the other end of the spectrum, we see industries like information with only 10% of occupations, 10% uh, of employment being at risk due to the fact that the occupations in that industry, people like software engineers, require a great deal of creative intelligence that's probably not readily replaced by an algorithm. So the final quantitative point I'd like to make, and one that was very much answering one of the questions we set out to answer, was that of how the probability of computerization relates to measures of skill. So in particular, we considered two measures of skill, one which was the median wage in an occupation, and the other was the fraction of people in an occupation who have at least a bachelor's degree. Now you can see by either of those measures of skill, a very clear negative trend with the probability of computerization. So simply put, the more skilled you are by either of these measures, the more secure you are from automation. So to me, this was probably the most alarming finding in our study because it suggests that it's exactly the people who are perhaps least well equipped to move into new forms of employment who are going to feel the burden of automation resting most heavily upon their shoulders. So I think this really does raise some concerns that the questions of inequality that we're already tackling in the West are only likely to worsen as a result of these technological trends. Nonetheless, there will be new jobs created, even if, as I say, they may not be ideally suited to the people who are put out of work. Here I have a slide listing the um, LinkedIn's uh, survey of new occupational titles created since the beginning of the 21st century. It's an interesting list. So we get iOS developers, Android developers, Zumba instructors, social media interns. If I flip over the, the slide, beach body coaches. So the first thing to say is that I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who would have been able to predict back in the year 2000 that Zumba instructors would have been one of the fastest growing occupations in 2014. So what I think this highlights is that it's very difficult to predict over a 10 year horizon or 15 year horizon what new jobs will be created. But I think we can highlight some trends here. So the kind of jobs that have seen growth in the last decade or so, to me at least, do capture these bottlenecks we identified. So someone like a beach body coach, you could argue, does require a lot of uh, manual skills, interacting with people's muscles perhaps. Um, social media interns certainly require some understanding of social intelligence. And you could argue that people like iOS developers require a lot of creativity in order to perform those jobs effectively. But the second point I want to make is that actually, despite these new industries being created that we might never have anticipated, they haven't actually generated all that much employment. So in a finding from a study performed by my co-author, Carl Frey, he found that only half of 1% of the current US workforce is working in industries that didn't exist at the beginning of the 21st century. So a minuscule fraction of jobs have actually been generated by these new industries. And I think that's probably a fairly familiar narrative to many of us. So if we think about the booming companies over the last decade, let's take the example of WhatsApp, it was bought out by uh, Facebook for 19 billion US, I think, at a point at which it had only 55 employees. So the entirety of the company would very comfortably fit into this room. As a comparison, that market valuation is about the same of the retailer Gap, the fashion retailer in the US, which has about 137,000 employees. So the concern is that these hyped new industries 
aren't actually generating the job growth we might want. So my final point is that fortunately that's not true for all industries. So here we have some examples of industries that actually are generating relatively significant numbers of jobs. They include things like wind energy engineers, solar energy ins installation managers, informatics nurse specialists. And what I think I speaks to here is that we as a society are really not short of challenges to tackle in the 21st century. And those challenges are very much going to demand human skills, human hands, human intelligence, human empathy, all things that are not going to be readily replaced by machines. So I think the challenge is really ensuring that we are encouraging these new industries, tackling these larger challenges of climate change in particular, making sure that they really are able to grow and support the job growth we need. So with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much.